Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Amanda Craig, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to the third and final part of today's conference, which is about achieving a healthy green recovery and the essential role of, of green infrastructure. And um, for those of you who, who are just joining us for, uh, th this afternoon, this has been jointly organised by Natural England and the uh, Town and Country Planning Association on behalf of the Green Infrastructure Partnership. And that partnership is free to join and uh, it, um, today has been made possible by the generous support of, of, of a number of, of sponsors to, to help us today, which has also helped with a wide range of free materials as well for you to look at and download if you click on the expo booth, which is on the left hand side of your screen. We're also live tweeting from this event and uh, hope you'll join in that as well. So we're using the hashtags, hashtag green 21 and hashtag green recovery as well, if you wanted to use those. And just as a bit of a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It will be available on the TCPA's website in a few days time as well. And all the delegates will be sent a link to, to that web page. So for those of you who've actually been with us this morning as well, we've heard some from some really great speakers covering what GI is, its role, its purpose and policy, and, and some examples of putting that into practice as well from the both private and public sector side. And this afternoon, um, we're continuing with a really exciting set of speakers looking at the Green Infrastructure Standards Framework itself, the evidence that's being captured, and we're going to be starting with the community perspective element. As with the previous sessions, we won't take questions after each presentation. We'll be, we'll be doing a set of Q&A collectively with, with all of the speakers after they've all spoken. But please use the Q&A box on the right hand side of, of your screen to post your questions. So that's the Q&A box that we'll be using to, to help lift some questions. Um, We'll also have a couple of polls that, that we'll be running during this afternoon's session as well. So um, we'll put those up as we go um, through, through this afternoon. The other bit probably worth um, noting that any Q&A that we don't manage to get to, we will also pull out some key themes and come back to delegates with, with responses um, and signposting to those as well. So your questions won't, won't be lost. So I'm going to move on then without further ado on to our speakers uh, for this afternoon. And I'd, I'd like to welcome our first speaker is Judy Ling Wong. And Judy is a painter, poet and environmentalist, best known as the honorary president of the Black Environment Network for pioneering multicultural environmental participation. Welcome to Judy. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. The way I work is I always put a lot of text on some slides as useful notes for you. I may pick out some key points, but not read to the rest. You're welcome to have the PowerPoint later, so you do not need to take notes. Just relax and enjoy the talk and the images. People are the ultimate force for change. We have agency. We need to put into place a culture of caring and sharing to give us the courage and the drive to dare to negotiate for inclusive participation. All of us can work together using our knowledge, skills, and passion to shape our future. The challenge of green infrastructure for the 21st century is set within the reality of an urbanizing world. The UN Deputy Secretary General at a high level meeting at UN Habitat linked environmental policy to human settlements. She said, the battle for sustainability will be fought won or lost in cities. And as a development of the new urban agenda, the first Global Stakeholders Forum was formed in 2019. Most of our disadvantaged citizens live in the deprived areas of our cities, although they are usually working and paying taxes. I'm excited to see these keywords in the green infrastructure framework. It is a framework for action that is completely practical, 
framed under why, what, and how. As an advocate for multicultural environmental participation, the shift towards increased attention on urban areas and benefits to diverse groups is very significant for me. Addressing inequalities is particularly close to my heart. It is notable, though, that everything that I touch on applies to the full range of disadvantaged groups as we have so much in common. The approach of the standards echo the Black Environment Network challenge that there is no such thing as a purely environmental initiative. A so-called purely environmental initiative is one that has rejected its social, cultural and economic dimensions. The power of replicable initiatives is really important. This presentation is completely practical too. We'll look at these examples under the themes of representation, engagement and provision. So here are notes about representation. The principle is that affected communities should lead. And I will go straight on to the examples. Do Google Climate Reframe. About a year ago, Dog Society challenged the media as to why multicultural voices were not appropriately visible. Their answer was, where do you find them? Dog Society responded with researching 100 established multicultural environmental experts and activists and put them onto an open database. So now there is no excuse. This database is moving the goalposts as it is being used by media, conference, event and workshop organizers. A second stage development aspires to include emerging voices to take it to a thousand. You may help to nominate them. This is a model for elevating the voices of all disadvantaged groups. Now, this is really good practice a local celebratory high-profile event, consciously ensuring diverse presence. And here's a city-based action contributing to a sense of belonging with a cultural feature in a green space. And opportunities in the city fringe. If you visit this wood now, you see nothing but trees and that little bilingual sign saying cows are wood in two languages. The memory of colour and ceremony are a thing of the past. The Sikh community has marked this place with memory, a significant cultural association. More notes for you about engagement. We benefit and we contribute. Now, this is a great example of people acting off their own bed to create a green neighbourhood, transforming the streets right outside their front doors, no project money needed. It requires a flexible attitude from the local authority to allow people to do things like planting in tree pits, putting pots on the pavement, or even lifting paving stones to plant bushes. But as long as a buggy or wheelchair can get through, all is well. This area is so heavily planted, they hardly notice the parked cars as you walk through these streets, you're consumed by the lushness of the place and the bird song. Every residential street should be like this. We have so little space within our cities to create substantial new parks and gardens as part of green infrastructure. But we can identify other spaces that can be doing this, including streets. So let's target residential urban streets where people live as part of the UK commitment to plant millions of trees for net zero. Research tells us that in some areas, purposeful planting have reduced the temperature by up to 10 degrees, linking into the climate change agenda to deal with heat islands. If we really look, there are spaces everywhere for transformation. And look what can be done. You can have things like this everywhere. So these spaces can be framed as the forest floor of our urban forest while enhancing health and well-being instead of just thinking of the canopy. 
And look at what Liverpool has done with a lot of space. It is the joy of nature, wild meadows on a grand scale. Planting indoors and businesses playing a role with pot plants on the street are part of the continuity of the vision to bring more nature into our lives. And we also need to do things like support initiatives that are replicated in every borough, like Think and Do, that has a direct line to power by being linked to the council. Do look up their citizens' assembly. All the recommendations have been taken up. The power of reimagining opens up all our futures. And the Everyone Everyday Initiatives program is extensive and impressive, including extensive maker spaces. And this is a storytelling rat that invites you to help knit his tail while doing things like linking into informal education. But seeing spaces differently makes things really different, even in the built environment, to have colour and the vibrance of natural patterns. Or look at what Kilburn has done. Real imagination and thousands of people go through this underground station every day. So work with inclusive movements too to unlock a vast contribution. London National Park City's website is a real model with how to guide everything you can dream of. Signposting is fundamental. The powerful process that is so human. We simply love what we enjoy and we protect what we love. But we cannot begin the process without accessing nature to love it. So partners with aligned common aims take us a long way in co-creating actions and resources. And you can't get closer to green infrastructure than London National Park City slogan, greener, healthier, wilder. And our ethnic minorities, of course, are global majorities. And they can do a lot through stories and contribute to the COP26 agenda where we need to really come closer to identification with the global community. Our ethnic minority stories can really inspire us to do that. So theme three, provision to address needs and to release benefits. A model for multifunctional space. Burgess Park is incredible. They created a backyard for the largest housing estate in the whole of Europe. And they mix everything from access to nature, beekeeping and so on, to a BM extract that produces European champions. Milesfields is an innovative local project and they pay attention to the popular perception that food growing gardening is in continuity with nature. And they have a project for mapping the growing potential of the spaces in Lambeth. They also notice that having a greenhouse means they can do that job of early start of the growing season for their community. They started with the offer of 5,000 plug plants. Within three years, they ended up with a demand for 50,000. So that opportunity of access to greenery is enormous. And of course, school grounds, where our children spend most of their time, laying down the foundation for a life with nature. We may be urban, but we need to access our most beautiful nature further afield, knowing that that kind of access inspires altogether a different kind of local action and a rich local future. And of course, COP26 is coming with people-centered policy, promoting green infrastructure as a key part of the solution in an urbanizing world must be there because all local actions sit within national and international frameworks of policy. Last but not least, a new wave of green jobs is coming. We are legally required to meet net zero. There are two new task force. One is the Green Jobs Task Force. The other one is the Green Apprenticeship Advisory Panel, which I chair. And I want to hear from you. Which are the new green jobs you want to expand green infrastructure? 
Well, green infrastructure is the key to building a world in which we thrive as people and nature together, and I look forward to working together. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you very much, Judy. I think if you click the leave button, we can get ourselves back on. That's grand. Thank you ever so much. Um, and, and thank you, Judy. Uh, wonderful as ever in terms of um, some really inspiring thoughts there. Uh, and I love your, your start over relaxing and enjoying the, the presentation, which I cer certainly did. Thank you. We're moving on to Jane Houghton, who's going to talk us through the green infrastructure standards framework itself. And Jane works at Natural England, uh, where she's project managing the development of the standards framework. And throughout Jane's career in the natural environment, she's worked to bring the benefits of the natural environment into urban communities. And before joining Natural England, Jane worked at the Royal Botanic Gardens of Kew in local authorities as a country park ranger and in non-government organisations. Welcome, Jane. We can see you, Jane. Oh, great. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. That's Thank grand. You. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to introduce the, the draft new green infrastructure standard framework. And this aims to help realise our ambitions to bring nature to everyone's doorstep and address inequalities, as well as contribute to the Nature Recovery Network across England. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk through the framework, its purpose and content, and set out next steps between now and the launch in 2022. Next slide, please. So our work on green infrastructure standards is delivering a 25 year environment plan commitment to review and update existing GI standards and develop a new framework of GI standards going forward and will then offer support to local authorities in assessing their GI provision against the new standards. And we're working with DEFRA and the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to see how those 25 year environment plan commitments on green infrastructure can be incorporated into national planning guidance and policy. We've got a cross government steering group, which includes DEFRA group, MHCLG, Department for Transport, Department for Education, Homes England, Public Health England, Sport England and Historic England. So broad range and 50 strong advisory group uh, with senior and practitioner GI representatives from across the sector and wider interests. So through the project, we're aiming to achieve the 25 year environment plans vision for GI uh, to improve existing green infrastructure and create more good quality GI that provides the benefits for health, nature, water, climate and prosperity and help the country recover from COVID-19 by ensuring that everyone has access to good quality GI provision by focusing on areas where we know there isn't enough accessible green infrastructure or that what there is is of poor quality and particularly in areas of multiple deprivation and health inequalities. And we want to mainstream GI as a key infrastructure in creating and maintaining sustainable places, including planning, so that new developments include GI and that any area with little or no green space can be improved for the benefit of the community. Our priority audiences are planners, developers, green space managers and communities, but also wider stakeholders <coughs> in health, transport and education, whose policies green infrastructure can help to deliver. So a key purpose of the framework is to support local areas in raising the bar around quantity, quality and function of GI to help them deliver their local vision of GI. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of our work over the past two and a half years to develop the GI standards framework. 
we worked with Exeter University to review the evidence for the health and wellbeing benefits of GI, and this is in our expo booth. And with LDA Design, the University of Manchester, Peter Neal and Vivid Economics, we reviewed the drivers of change for GI and 40 existing GI standards, including two in depth, the other green factors and the accessible natural green space standards. And we developed draft principles and processes for good GI. And we're also developing GI mapping for England with RSK ADAS and the West Country Rivers Trust. And with these resulting products, we've trialled and tested these in 10 areas across England. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the 10 trials are, are listed here and our trials partners range from city regions to a community and business partnership. The trials were coordinated by the contractor Brillianto and this exercise has proved really useful in providing feedback and recommendations which we've used to help shape the framework components and our next steps. Next slide please. So this slide shows the updated structure of the GI standards framework and each coloured box represents a component within it. The principles of good GI are shown in the green box and they aim to provide clarity and common understanding about why good GI is important, the benefits and the outcomes of GI, what good GI is and the way to plan, deliver and stewardship it. Um, and these principles reflect best practice in GI across the country. So the principles are really the golden thread running through the framework and they underpin all the different elements. So moving to the uh, GI standards on the right, these will be voluntary standards and then include firstly a core menu of standards aiming to support local planning authorities in taking a strategic approach to GI and we'll also signpost to all the existing GI standards raising their profile with stakeholders. The GI mapping, um, we're, developing, <coughs> excuse me, we're developing a baseline map of green infrastructure across England, it's the first of its kind which we've analysed to help stakeholders identify priorities for GI and where the benefits are most needed. And Martin will talk more about this later. The GI design guide will help stakeholders design good GI to deliver different functions and benefits. And it'll be particularly helpful to local planning authorities in developing their local design codes linked to the National Model Design Code, which Joanna talked about this morning. So Andrew Linfoot will say more about that. And the case studies will share good practice being demonstrated across England. So moving down to the action checklists and the process guidance, these set out the different element, how the different elements of the framework can be used for different GI exercises, GI strategies, master plans, neighbourhood planning, development decisions, enhancing parks and green spaces, retrofitting and so on. And finally, the monitoring evaluation box at the bottom will be developing a national monitoring and evaluation plan for England to capture a baseline and also share good practice approaches to local GI monitoring and evaluation. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the GI principles in more detail. And <clears throat> these respond to early discussions with our advisory group identifying that a key barrier to GI delivery was the lack of clarity about what good GI quality and quality provision is. So the principles are divided into three sets. Um, the blue circle in the middle highlight the main benefits, why we do GI, and we're calling these the benefits principles. The orange circles uh, set out five principles that clarify and share understanding about what good GI is. And the green circle set out the ways to achieve good GI, how to plan, deliver, maintain and stewardship long term. So just to talk through each principle briefly, um, the full version is in the Natural England Expo booth. Um, so they're there to, to we, we'd welcome you to go and have a look at them there. Um, so starting with the blue principles in the middle, um, these are nature rich, beautiful places. Uh, so GI should help nature to recover and thrive everywhere in towns, cities and countryside as we know that nature is fundamental to all the other benefits and outcomes of GI. And then active and healthy places, thriving and prosperous places, understanding and managing the water environment, 
so reducing flood risk, improving water quality, as well as bringing amenity and biodiversity benefits, and then resilient and climate positive places, so GI helping to meet zero carbon and air quality targets. And then the uh, descriptive principles, the orange circles starting at the top, uh, we've got multi multiple functions and benefits, so multifunctionality, um, that GI should include a mix of types and sizes of GI that can provide a range of functions and benefits to address specific issues and needs. Uh, connected as a living network at all scales, connecting provision of GI with those who need its benefits. And then accessible, that GI creates green livable places where everyone has access to good quality GI. And character, GI should respond to and enhance an area's character. Moving on to the uh, way principles, the process principles, partnership, working, collaboration, and wide and inclusive stakeholder engagement are needed from the outset to create and deliver a, dish, a vision for GI. And then using scientific evidence, local data, and good land use practices, planning GI strategically and securing it as a key asset in local strategy and policy at all scales and integrating a mainstream in GI into wider policy, designing GI to create beautiful and well-designed places, and planning good governance, funding, management, monitoring and evaluation of GI as a key asset from the outset, secured for the long term, and engaging communities in stewardship where appropriate. So as I mentioned, the full principles are in the Expo Booth and we'll provide a longer version with links to further in information in the autumn. Next slide, please. So moving on to the role of standards themselves. Um, firstly, just helpful to clarify definitions. What do we mean by standards here? Um, so we're defining standards as the British Standards Institute does as an agreed way of doing something, a common approach. And also standards can be a level of quality or attainment, so a measure, um, norm or model for comparison. And in the GI standards framework, we're using the term in both senses as a way of doing GI, the ways, principles and action checklists, but also in the sense of a level of quality or attainment. And as I mentioned, the GI framework will be voluntary and local authorities will be encouraged to adapt the standards or adopt the standards to set their own local standards and targets. Um, a number of GI standards are already commonly used in England and many of these are long established and trusted by planning and development professionals. So the GI standards framework isn't intended to replace or contradict these, but to set a context for the continued and increased use of existing GI standards and factors, etc., to support their delivery and um, delivering more and better GI. So our GI standards web portal will signpost users to these existing standards to encourage people to use them in combination with the new GI standards framework. But the, the GI standards framework also aims to bring more consistency and weight to the use of standards locally to help raise the level of ambition for GI to address the challenges we've talked about, biodiversity loss, COVID-19, inequalities in health, climate change, and the need for a healthy green recovery. And in this way, the standards will help to deliver government policy on GI and increase its effectiveness in delivering benefits for people in the environment. And our trial partners um, recommended that there should be a core menu of national standards. So a succinct list from which local planning authorities can set local GI standards. And such a menu would then support local authorities in incorporating GI standards and targets into their local plans to achieve their GI vision. Next slide, please. So the core menu will include standards for the process, quantity, quality, functionality and accessibility or location of GI. And we'll identify the component standards for the core menu in the next phase of work starting in September. But I'll say more about two of the standards that are in scope in a moment. Um, and because it's very, ch very challenging to achieve standards to the same level in greenfield and brownfield, urban and rural, etc., we'll develop benchmarks for good GI provision in the different types of locations shown here. And we'll start by undertaking a survey across England to capture current practice and delivery. Next slide, please. 
So just to say a bit more about um, the accessible natural green space standards, the first of the two standards we're considering for the core menu. Um, natural England developed this in the 1990s. Um, it states that everyone should have access to natural green space of the following sizes within the given distances from home. So it's a quantity and distance standard and needs to be used in conjunction with quality standards, local information and community engagement. But following the University of Manchester's review, we're proposing two updates. So they're highlighted here in green, adding a criteria for doorstep green space um, of 0.5 hectares or at least 0.5 hectares within 200 metres of home. And this responds to an analysis during lockdown that showed that one in eight households doesn't have access to a garden. And so community gardens and smaller pocket parks of this kind of size can be especially important in areas where there are high numbers of flats. And the other, the neighbourhood natural green space, um, is, comes out of the fact that people we know like to walk to green spaces, but if they're more than about a kilometre away, people tend to start taking the car more often. So to maximise the physical health benefits of walking and to cut down on car use, carbon and air pollution, we're promoting green space within one kilometre and about 50% of the population have access to 10 hectares within one kilometre. So the accessible natural green space standard is a very important tool to help identify inequalities in provision and Martin will give some analysis later. Next slide please. The second um, standard for, in scope for the core menu is the urban greening factor um, and it's a planning tool to enhance greening of urban districts. We're going to develop a, a model of greening factor, building on the learning from its use in this country and across Europe and North America, um, with a particular focus um, on uh, the function of the green elements provided as well as their quantity. Um, and this is something that will develop so that local areas can adapt or adopt it in their local plans. Um, the, this tool um, sets out factors of between 0 and 1 for different surface cover types. So as shown here, hard sealed surface, surfaces are given a score of zero, but the greenest and most natural surfaces, uh, not actually shown on the side, get a score of one. And <clears throat> local authorities can set different thresholds um, uh, around these, um, but the GSF score for a particular site is calculated by multiplying the area of each surface cover type with the factor that's assigned to that type, um, adding those together and dividing the total area, with, uh, dividing the total by the total site area, and you get a score between 0 and 1. Um, so urban greening factors are commonly set at about 0.4 for residential and 0.3 for commercial, but that's down to the local authority. And the urban green factor is particularly suited in existing urban areas where there's little biodiversity, uh, and here it can help to green development, green developments, and it's a, an easy tool to use, uh, doesn't require ecological expertise, and we'll explore how it can respond to local context and strategy in our next phase of work. Next slide, please. So um, finally, just to summarise our next steps, um, we're going to pre-release uh, the green infrastructure mapping to local planning authorities and the Green Infrastructure Partnership in autumn this year. Further develop and test the core GI standards and other products, then launch the GI standards framework in summer 2022, followed by a consultation, we'll refine the framework and then roll it out and we'd like to really collaborate with the GI sector on the rollout, on promotion and training. Um, and we'll be working with the planning advisory service to provide some of that training. So it's a very, exist a very exciting time in this work. Um, we'll keep stakeholders posted through the Green Infrastructure Partnership newsletter um, and provide links to the web portal there in the autumn. Um, I hope that's been helpful. Many thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Jane. Uh, that was superb. Lots of work going on there. And as you say, at the cusp of some really exciting stuff that, that's that's about to, to be launched as well. So thank you ever so much. Right, we're moving on to our 
third speaker, who is Andrew Linfoot. And um, just before Andrew starts, we've got a poll that is about to go up as well for you to have a look at whilst Andrew is talking as well. So have a look at that one on, on the right hand side of, of your screen. Um, and Andrew is Jacob's Global Technology Lead for Landscape Architecture. And his role is about strategy, driving innovation and connectivity across technologies and people and delivering excellence. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd just like to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking through um, our work with Natural England on the Green Infrastructure Design Guide. Um, I don't propose to spend much time on the actual design guide itself, but more about the approach and the philosophy and um, see how, um, explain how we're connecting it back into a lot of things that we've already heard this morning. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so sadly, this slide has got too many words and not enough pictures, but more pictures are coming, I promise. Um, so our approach is very much focused on the outcomes. It's about addressing those health and well-being, that climate and those bio biodiverse emergencies that face us. Um, and that's very much embedded in our whole thinking. We are looking at meeting the needs of it, meeting meeting the needs of its users. So our principal audience are local government officers, um, but it, we think it's going to have appeal to the developers. And we've heard earlier today about the need for everybody to play a part in developing and delivering good green infrastructure. I'm quite interested to know about what it is that we need to do to get over the barriers. How do we deliver green infrastructure as a mainstream? How do we do it as just the default? Um, and our guide is very much aimed at providing that confidence to deliver green infrastructure. And hopefully my poll is running along in the background. We will be providing evidence and uh, Jane has already indicated that in the framework, the evidence will be provided to illustrate that it can be done and that it can be done well. Um, but equally, we're looking at it being pragmatic. We want to make it real. We want, as I said at the beginning, we want this to actually happen. And where it happens is important as well. We've heard a lot about strategy and policy throughout today, but we also want to take it right the way through to mowing the grass. And mowing the grass is about thinking about that long-term green infrastructure success at the design stage, as we heard earlier on in the, in the in the talk, but equally, how do we make sure that that is funded effectively? How do we ensure that that long-term success actually happens? And again, there was an earlier discussion. Um, we are linking it to the national design codes and how can green infrastructure be delivered through those codes um, and very much tied to those. And there was a lot of chat earlier um, in the first session this morning about how those connections are made. So we're looking to try and make those. Um, we are looking at a context driven design guide, recognizing the diversity of our landscapes and our places, making sure that we're not rolling out a ubiquitous design solution and recognizing as we again as we heard earlier in the session that in some landscapes a chalk grassland is important and how we capture those baselines in what we do and build that into our context um, and last but not least of course fundamentally it's all about building better and building beautiful so next slide please so I did promise pictures so bear with me with this one we're trying to sort of capture further thoughts on how um, those benefit principles are the outcomes that we're looking at. And we heard from Jane earlier about those principles, those benefits that are across the top there about managing the water environment, delivering nature rich and beautiful spaces, that resilient and positive places that we're looking for. And we've heard a lot today about active and healthy places and thriving and prosperous communities. So those are those outcomes. What we can also see through there in the white boxes are those those principles and those carried through the water, nature, climate, health and well-being and prosperous communities are all carried through into those systems, which are the horizontal lines. So water, biodiversity and soils are those principal systems and those green infrastructure functions, which we'll come back to in a minute. But what you can see just from trying to draw this out is that whilst we're looking at those outcomes at the top, those benefits that we're looking to deliver, a great many functions all need to work together to deliver those functions effectively um, and in a way which is more than just a single function taking one place. And again, I'll come back to that in a second. So the next slide, please. Thank you. What we're looking at within the design guide is using typologies. Um, we heard at the beginning of the day about the need for green infrastructure to consider the rural landscape right the way through to the urban landscape. 
um, and you can see there an, an indication of the sort of typologies that we're looking at to try and explain what it is and how it works. Um, and we'll be using quite a lot of diagrams and illustrations to indicate to the users of the, the, the design guide how it, how it works and what it is. Um, and you'll start to recognize some of those diagrams from the National Design Codes, um, but we're keen very much to sort of use those real places to illustrate that. Throughout them, multifunctionality is key across all of it, as illustrated on the previous slide, but a variety that connections, accessibility and character are all of those things that underpin good green infrastructure. So next slide, please. Thank you. So you'll recognize the colors, I hope, from the National Model Design Codes. What we're looking to do here is link both our characteristics of well-designed places, which sit within the National Model Design Code, which sit across the top. And on the um, horizontal scale, we have our green infrastructure systems and functions. And no doubt, in due course, there will be lots of debate about whether or not we've missed one or two of these connections. The principal colors are where we think for now, those main connections are between the functions and systems and the characteristics of well-designed places. Those that are in grey, we think they're sort of secondary effects. And I'm sure, as I've said, there'll be a debate about why haven't we included those and why do we have white squares? Because I think as well, the more we explore this, the more we realise it's a very complex multifunctional system that we're looking for with multiple benefits. So next slide, please. So my last slide here is just really to illustrate a lot of what we're talking about here. So this initially started off as a cross section through a residential development, and we were looking at it under the heading of active lifestyles. And you soon start to realize how many different functions start to come into play together. We heard earlier today about the, the, purpose, the usefulness of trees, how that they provide shade, but they can, um, you know, that they have create that so, um, important in placemaking, that they start to have linear functions for bats. How then do we connect those sustainable modes of transport? How do we encourage those connections without using the, the automobile? Um, into that is the use, easy to use wayfinding, but then you start connecting that up into how does it relate to those places that people want to go to, those parks, those open spaces, be that those sports fields or those simple smaller spaces where people can meet and gather and have that social interaction that we've been so missing over the last year or so. But you can also start to see where you bring in those other functions. So whilst we might have sustainable urban drainage systems in there, does it have to be a mown grass solution? Can we bring in planting? Can we encourage that diversity, that habit, those habitats and that biodiversity? And of course, the answer there is yes. So that's very much a very quick run through of what the green infrastructure design guide is going to contain um, so hopefully you can contribute to the the uh, the poll because we're very keen that this becomes mainstream that those benefits that everybody has talked about throughout the day are delivered that they happen on the ground um, because you know we believe that it very much needs to happen so, thank you Thanks very much, Andrew. There's there's a wealth of information in, in the design guide, so that that was uh, that was great. Thank you, thank you ever so much for taking us through that. And uh, a few questions coming up on the uh, Q and A uh, as well, and um, we can come back to the the poll, Andrew. That, that would be, that's really insightful as well. So I'm now moving on to Martin Moss, um, our final speaker of this session who's going to be talking a lot about the evidence and the baseline mapping. And Martin has 27 years working for the Countryside Commission, Countryside Agency, and now for Natural England, and has specialised in green infrastructure work for much of that time. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. Hello, hopefully you can, you can hear me. Um, my name is Martin Moss, I work for Natural England, I'm a senior advisor in green infrastructure and welcome to what I think is the graveyard spot, as it's often known. Um, so if you've been with us all day and it looks like 371 people might have, then very well done, uh, but we're on the home stretch. Um, I'm going to talk about the England baseline green infrastructure mapping, but uh, I do have a throat infection and consequently, if I do get a bit croaky, it's probably not your Wi-Fi, it's probably my throat. But whilst the voice isn't too bad, if we can move on to my first slide, please. 
Let's talk about why we're doing the work in the first place. And we go back to this thing that's been mentioned several times today, uh, the 25 year environment plan, and in particular, uh, chapter three, which is concerning uh, connecting people with the environment to improve health and well-being. And there are three key commitments in there about helping uh, people improve their health and well-being using green spaces, uh, encouraging children to be closer to nature, and greening our towns and cities. So there are a variety of commitments which give us a direction of travel. I think we know quite a lot about where we want to go. Uh, the core question, uh, particularly with the mapping, is well, where are we now? And how do we know uh, if we are changing things on the ground over time? And is that change positive? Are we going up? Are we going down? Are we staying the same? And place to place, uh, how does that pan out? What does that mean? So the mapping is designed to give us uh, more or less um, a datable baseline position from which to measure change. Uh, can I have my second slide, please? So key objectives behind the mapping, basically there are four of them. We want to provide a resource which is nationally consistent, that is cross authority uh, at an England level, um, relating to green infrastructure mapping and analysis. There's a lot of green infrastructure mapping out there. There's some really excellent uh, material I'm not going to be. But what we've lacked up until now is something which operates at an England wide scale. In other words, once you cross uh, a local authority boundary, it is consistent. Uh, so that's the first objective. The second is to provide all areas across England with equal access to data and maps. So whether you're in Berwick-on-Tweed, Penzance or Margate, you have one equal consistent database which is as publicly accessible uh, as we can make it and we seek to provide evidence that will support a range of national to local strategy and targeting uh, needs uh, and provide information at multiple scales so it has to work at an england scale but we also want it to work at a local authority scale and at what are called middle super output areas and lower super output areas which you've not if you've not come across those, they are basically uh, levels of statistical geography used by the um, Office for National Statistics. So we've got something that works at, at, at different levels, levels but the, the key thing is the closer to the ground you get, this is a national mapping exercise, this, this information starts to pixelate. So you'll always have to drill into it and supplement it with local data and local knowledge to refocus it into a sharp picture, if we can move on. And what we're going to do today, very briefly, 20 minutes, short amount of time, a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, I can't go through it all. We're going to focus on five things, one of which is what we call the green infrastructure asset map, which is the core, uh, the heart uh, of the mapping database. And then four of the analyses that we've been able to do. One, uh, our old friend, friend, accessible natural green space standards analysis, which is a right tongue twister, and I trip over it all the time. So I tend to call it angst. So if I do refer to angst, that's what I'm talking about. Um, we drilled on beyond angst to natural uh, sort of accessible natural green space inequalities analysis and we've also done a few specific analyses one looking at nature close to home for children and one looking at i think for the first time an access to water side uh, analysis across england so if we can go to the next slide our first analysis, this is, if you've never seen one, a green infrastructure asset map. So what we're doing here is bringing together a range of data sets with, with a very large dot of the cap towards the Ordnance Survey, mapping the location of a range of different types of spaces, um, sort of hybrid between land use uh, and land cover, according to a typology. Now, uh, what we do then is to underpin that with a range of environmental data sets on the one side and socioeconomic data sets on the other in order to create create a set of analyses. So we're using this as the, the heart of the database to ask questions and get answers. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide. So our first question was, of all the green infrastructure we have out there, um, how much of it is actually accessible? So what is the publicly accessible element of the resource that we have? Um, in this, we have, we've taken quite a narrow line because we want, to we want to focus on those spaces that we're pretty sure are actually publicly accessible. So what we mean are those are the spaces, the green spaces, which are normally accessible to the general public, at least in daylight hours, are free to access and uh, provide for a range of informal pastimes, recreational activities, general contemplation and enjoyment. That does not mean if the site contains a football ground or a bowling pitch that it's not considered. They are part of the park, so it is, uh, it is uh, included. But generally, we, we want to be sure we're looking at spaces that are provided specifically for public access or over which there is a right of public access as established by the Countryside and Rights of Way Act uh, 2006. So locally, and on that map even, there will be other spaces which are used 
uh, accessible spaces which are used by uh, the community in a range of different situations which we have not included. So this is where we start to see the importance of supplementing the national data with local data. We don't necessarily have that data uh, at the national level. So the true picture of accessible spaces and what spaces people are using will be more detailed. But for the purposes of our analysis, we've taken quite a narrow approach. So next slide, please. And in doing that, we've heard about accessible natural green space standards. Well, we've had to map them. Uh, my colleague Jane referred to the six standards benchmarks that we, we now have uh, in the system, a range of sizes and distance. And we've used those sizes and distances to create what we call buffer maps. And I'll refer to buffer maps a bit later. This is an example of a buffer map. So this is what we call the doorstep standard buffer map. And the doorstep standard advocates the provision of a green space at least 0.5 hectares within 200 meters. Might be easier to think about that in terms of it's about the size of a football pitch. The football pitch is back uh, within about five minutes walk. Well, that depends how fast you walk. If you're a fit teenager, you might do it in two or three minutes. If you're taking a toddler on the range for a walk, it could be anything up to half an hour because they don't walk in straight lines. But it's roughly about that. And we think that across England, about one in three people uh, are, are within what we call the doorstep buffer. Does that mean they all have equal access within that buffer? The answer is no. If you drill into that and undertake something called uh, network analysis, which is looking in much finer detail about how people can actually get to these spaces, we find that that one in three drops to well, possibly one in four, and certainly in some places down to one in six. So if you think one in three sounds bad, one in six sounds an awful lot worse. Can we move on to the next slide? Please. We have six standards and therefore we can have six buffers and they all interact, interact um, spatially. So one of the things we are trying to do is to understand that interaction of buffers uh, locally so that we can get a view of the, the green space provision, accessible natural green space provision across England from a sort of local to strategic level. And that, uh, if we overlap all the buffers onto one map, creates what looks like a complicated map. But essentially, if you click on one of those buffers, so the green spaces com um, conversely are the blue spaces, and the green bits are the buffers around the green spaces. And if you click on any point, what will come up uh, in the data is what I call the angst profile. This tells you which buffers you're in and which buffers you're out. No more complicated than that. But this particular space here uh, with the box uh, and the arrow on the left-hand side, that tells us that this space hits three buffers, which are the strategic green green space provision, so the 10 kilometer, the five kilometer, uh, and the two kilometer, uh, but it doesn't have any local green space provision. So you're in three and out two. We didn't do six at this point for this map. So possibly uh, it would be in three, out three, middle, medium score. So good strategic provision, poor local provision, but does that matter? Next slide, please. So in order to start to try and answer that question, we need to change the map. And um, we also need to change the approach uh, and start to look at what we call accessible natural green space inequalities. So this is about the inequality of provision and identifying characteristics which can tell us something about the significance of that. So this uses what's called bivariate analysis. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go into the detail. The key thing here is we are comparing one thing with another. So we are comparing the percentage of an area that is covered by one of those access to natural green space buffers with a another variable. The two we picked for this analysis this time round with the index of multiple deprivation and population density. So we're trying to use this method to assign what we call an inequality class, which is a scenario really, giving some indication of the level and the significance of, of inequality in any particular uh, location. So key for this one is get your eye on the L1 box. That's the red box in the top sort of left hand corner, because that's where we're, th we're saying we think these are the least favorable scenario areas where access inequality is potentially at its most intense. Can we go to the next map, please? If you plot those at various geographies, this one being our, our old favorite lower super output areas, these are spaces with approximately 1,500 people in them across England. There are 32,000 of them. You get a complicated map. Um, but if you keep your eye on that red box, th that red box is telling you this is where we think the scenario is at its most intense. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at places which are uh, very low, less than 5% in terms of 
coverage of the buffer. That doesn't necessarily mean you even got a green space in the LSOA, you might be next door. So very low buffer coverage, very low accessibility with high levels uh, of deprivation according to the IMD. And on the right hand side, we have the similar approach, but with population density. So places which are low buffer coverage, but they've got a lot of people in them, over 10,000 people per square kilometer, so high density. And you can see instantly that the factor you determine uh, to plot against uh, the uh, buffer coverage will determine the map you get. So there's no absolute measure uh, of inequality here. It, it depends on who you're interested in and what you're interested in as to where you will find that inequality. Nonetheless, we hope these will provide a means for us to start to under understand those places where access inequality is potentially at its most extreme. But again, circumstances on the ground may be different. So local data and knowledge would be needed to refine uh, such maps of these. If we can move on, please. Um, we talked a lot about provision in general terms. We also want to understand provision in terms of uh, different different parts of our communities. So we've undertaken some a few specific population related uh, exercises. Uh, the, the chief one, the main one, is actually looking at children. We have aspirations in terms of policy for more children to have daily contact with nature. And that reflects straight back to one of the aspirations in the 25 year plan, chapter three. Uh, that means we need more nature rich space places um, close to where children live. And to understand where we are with that, we've created what we call, or what I call, the nature close to home zone. So this is a 300 meter buffer around places we've assessed as being relatively nature rich, we would expect them to be na more nature rich than perhaps the average. And we've assessed the percentage of children who are effectively within 300 meters uh, of that. So it's not exactly rocket science, but if we have the next slide, what we end up with is this sort of information. So on the left hand side, far left, we have that is the close to home zone. And we can see some places have a lot of it and some places have very little of it and some places have none at all. Uh, if we then use that to plot the percentage of children under uh, under 16 uh, who are within the close to home zone again a massively variable picture ranging from absolute zero to something in excess of two-thirds so uh, depending on where you are you know you, you're really going to be affected um, by uh, whether you have access for as a child uh, to nature close to home if we look at that uh, at a local authority level the mean percentage of children by local authority who have access to nature rich places close to home is about 26%. Bearing in mind what I said previously, we think these are overestimates. So it may well be um, some way below 26%, but one in four is not a good position to start with. And if it's less than that, well, it's even worse. Next slide, please. And finally, my final analysis today, we've heard a great deal about uh, green spaces today, but what about our blue spaces? So blue infrastructure is a fundamental element of the green infrastructure database that we're putting together. And we have established a blue infrastructure network of water courses uh, and water bodies uh, from a variety of data sets. And we are going to use that as well uh, to, to do undertake a, a variety of analyses. And the one we've been able to do so far is an analysis specifically looking at access to water side. I must repeat that, access to water side. What is that? It is access to water side that is publicly in close proximity, either uh, 10 meters of a public right of way or is within or adjacent to um, an actual publicly accessible green space. This is not access to water, therefore. That is a whole different box of frogs and we haven't even gone there yet. So we're looking at how much water side have we got that's the central map. So that is the waterside resource uh, across England mapped at uh, kilometers per um, per LS away. And the left, the right hand map is how much of the resource that there is, is uh, that's the wrong map. Sorry, that's, uh, that is the wrong map on my side it's different there is there is supposed to be on the right hand side a map of how much of it is actually accessible in which case a great deal of that blue space actually disappears so not only do we have this equity in terms of the distribution of green spaces we also have a similar position with blue spaces but of course the approach to blue space will be radically different uh, to that of green space and we can move on to uh, the next slide, final analysis slide, uh, that drills down into very detailed maps. So on the left, you can see a map showing example of the coincidence of public rights of way uh, and a 10 meter buffer intersecting with the water course. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see the map showing, uh, no, it's replicated again. I don't know why it's done that. There is a map showing accessible natural green space with a one meter buffer intersecting uh, a water course. Uh, that should be a different map. I don't know what's happened here for both those slides, uh, but basically a lot of information, not just about green spaces and accessibility, but also uh, blue space as well. So if we can move on, nearly done here. Um, 
what next? Well, we've done a lot of work. There's an awful lot more work to do. We have aspirations to break out of accessibility and to, into other themes, but we're working to make the work we've done so far uh, available uh, by the website that we'll be uh, hopefully switching on sometime in the autumn of this year uh, for the Green Infrastructure Standards uh, Framework. A large part of what we will be able to make available in the autumn will be the mapping work that we've done to date. If I move to the next slide, please. When we do so, there will be a feedback mechanism built in. So we've done some analyses and they are, as far as I'm concerned, very much a first step towards understanding some complex issues at an England wide level. But we're not saying we've got it banged to rights. Uh, what we are saying is we've done some work and we'd like some feedback. We'd like some feedback on the approaches taken. We'd like to know how they match up with circumstances on the ground. We'd like to know how usable they are in policy and practical terms. And we'd also like to know how we can improve them. So what we publish, uh, hopefully, in uh, the autumn of this year will be version 1.1 this is the beginning it is not the end and we'll be seeking going forward long term to be able to update and improve uh, the data and the maps over time my almost final slide next is just some acknowledgements my funders have been deaf for natural england the natural capital and ecosystems assessment program uh, the work's been done for natural england depra by ADAS, the, the heavy lifting has been done by ADAS with the blue infrastructure work being done by the West Country Rivers Trust. And my final slide is just to say thank you for listening. This is the end of the story so far, but it is not the end of the story. Uh, I will be back and therefore hope to see you again. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you ever so much, Martin, and uh, an amazing wealth of, of data and, and evidence there, which is which is brilliant. Thank you. Now, whilst I'm just waiting for panel members to put their microphones and cameras back on, we do have another poll to go up on the right hand side of the screen. If people wanted to uh, have a go at that as well. Thank you. Right. So we have a, a good set of, of questions that, that have come in. Thank you ever so much for, for everyone for your engagement there. I'm going to start with some of the most um, popular ones, actually, just on the voting system. Um, Andrew, I was going to start with you, actually, because we've had quite a few questions around retrofitting in particular. So how might we fit green infrastructure into existing streets and also some, some other sort of related elements of retrofitting over how do we tackle that within dense urban areas or dense historic town centres? But just be interested in your thoughts, Andrew, around that. No, I think like starting with the easy ones. Um, yeah, I, I think we go to some extent go back to Judy's opening um, presentation that um, it requires the will of the people and the neighbourhoods that they live in to push for those changes. Um, you know, things like low traffic neighbourhoods, for example. You know, how do we get through traffic out of those places where? The kids want to play on the street how can we remove those car parking spaces to swap that space you know to lift those paving slabs and put the trees and the, the green infrastructure that people so you know are, are looking for um it requires that i suppose that shift in an, an acceptance um that you know that our existing streets and spaces can adapt um, that we can bring in those green infrastructure functions into those spaces um but i suppose last but not least it needs some money um, you know, to sort of whilst the communities can do so much on their own um, and we can adapt and you know to some extent take over the control of what you know some limited spaces to do it at scale and to do it um, you know requ requires that shift in approach but also funding to really achieve it um, and where does that funding sit on the list of all of the other things the limited finances need to cover that doesn't really yeah, answer the question, but I think it just the, the, presents it, a whole it, load more problems. It, it, it does, though, Andrew, and I think yeah. it's, this is where sometimes the, the, the thoughts of people <clears throat> can sometimes be that, that this is about new development, which it, clearly it's not. It's yeah. not, is it? Not just about new development. Jane, is there anything in terms of um, the experience learned so far with with the green infrastructure standards over um, the questions that are arising around and challenges around retrofitting? Um, 
I mean, yeah, we recognise that uh, retrofitting, retrofitting is hugely important um, as a means of greening neighbourhoods, existing areas, and, <clears throat> and also as part of regeneration programmes. And there's a fantastic example in Bury, the new road regeneration programme, where they planted 20 trees that are greening and providing that community benefit, but also are contributing to surface water drainage um, mitigation, uh, reducing flooding risk. And um, I think, you know, we're particularly looking at including street trees and urban canopy cover in terms of the design guide and also the potential core menu of standards. You know, is there a potential there to include standards around tree cover, street trees, um, and they can be adapted with benchmarks in different locations? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Um, Judy, there's... Um, there's a, there's been a lot lot of response to your presentation, which which is great actually, and a few questions around contacts and things, which we will have to pick up. We'll, we'll pick that up, up afterwards. But certainly one of the the key ones coming through is obviously the importance of engaging people at, um, of of different backgrounds and things. Um, and that there's also the points around how we might amplify local voices. I was just wondering about your thoughts over what you've what you observe and how might we be able to do this better do you think i think we need to take people's actions much more seriously and celebrate them and as i said many of the examples i gave they're completely replicable you know it's not as if we don't know what to do we want more at scale and one of the things that andrew talked about about money and so on you know look the voluntary sector brings money into the local authority we need to notice that when we encourage them to do environmental things, they apply for money, which you don't have to give them. I mean, and then they work for it. So that encouragement and engagement and enabling. And I think that there's not enough done about people visiting each other's projects. You know, when you actually talk to people exactly like you who've done fabulous things and what they actually did, you can see how possible it is. That sense of power and sense of possibility drives people to act. So that networking, you know, and, and then, of course, local authorities can do more about setting up community spaces like Think and Do, where groups come in, but with a direct link into the council. So that it's not like people or Danes Council demanding things, but working together, coming with ideas and seeing that the listening is actually there and finding their way. As I said, switching on those things that community can give you. Don't just think that they're helpless. They are full of energy. And we find that Black Environment Network over the years that the more deprived a community is, if you can show them they can do it, they got double the energy of the white middle class because there's so much caught up energy in their lives that can be released. Yeah, that 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 sounds that sounds great. But yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot for us to learn from networking. And that isn't there. I can really see that. And they can um, lead. You know, the the whole idea that that affected communities should lead. I think this has to go up the levels of power. And when they understand that and begin to do that, you release a lot of contribution. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, fan fantastic, fantastic. Um, I'm going to move us on to a, a question that's been asked throughout the day, actually, Jane, I was going to come to you, actually. You did cover this a bit in, in, um, in your presentation, but actually, what's the actual status of the GI standards and also Natural England's accessible green space standards? Particularly, this plays into: Are they voluntary? Do they have teeth? And uh, and probably in the context of this, do we foresee? Um, you know, what are the challenges uh, around all of that around the implementation of the standards themselves? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so just to confirm that the, the standards are will be voluntary and but because and because they sit so closely um, with biodiversity net gain, the opportunities for biodiversity net gain to deliver GI and for GI to do the same, that um, we're expecting that the mandatory status of biodiversity net gain will act as a driver on green infrastructure provision and in turn 
that those provide opportunities for the GI standards to be delivered. And, you know, for example, the fact that biodiversity net gain is required to be managed and conserved for 30 years, that that will have a, an impact on all the uh, green infrastructure that's delivered through biodiversity net gain. Um, and similarly with the uh, environment bills introduction of local nature recovery strategies that will be a statutory requirement that green infrastructure strategies that will be shaped by the GI standards can inform those local nature recovery strategies so again there's an opportunity for the standards to to be incorporated into <coughs> a statutory process um, and all areas will have their local nature recovery strategies across England that give that opportunity for GI to be reflected. Um, <clears throat> the, as I said sort of earlier, the, the standards are already uh, referenced in the National Model Design Code. So um, there's guidance in there about how local authorities can use the standards in developing their own local codes and conversations that they have around that. Um, so that'd be a really you know, great opportunity to embed the standards in local conversations, local areas. Um, but throughout the programme, we're discussing the standards with NHDRG, you know, they're on our steering group. And so it's a live conversation. Um, we can't, uh, you know, uh, we understand that um, the MPPF was consulted on and NHDRG is considering uh, the, the results of that consultation. So we, we don't yet know what that will mean for the GI standards, but yeah, we're looking forward to, to seeing that. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. I was just wondering if there's any observations for, 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 from others over um, the experiences, I suppose, I mean, Judy, particularly from local communities over over the status of the standards themselves. Do you think that's, that's a challenge? Well, I think the idea that everything actually, when it's, it comes to implementation, has got to gather local data to make it relevant and have enough detail that people recognize it. And when you do that, it is really powerful. Groups are already recognizing this. I mean, the group that I mentioned, Myers Fields in, in Lambeth and so on, they, they did their own mapping of their ward where they're actually living. And people were just really interested to see, ah, I'm actually in that space. This is where something is and so on. And now they're taking this project the lamp of right wide to map all the opportunities for food growth. Now they could do other things, which is mapping all the opportunities for wildflower meadows, for all sorts of things like all the opportunities for where trees can grow, things like where can the really big tree go? You know, all these things that people really understand at the local level becomes really exciting. I think you, if you create a sense of excitement that local things right in front of their doors and within walking distance and so on are going to change their lives. My goodness, people are interested. Yeah, yeah, they definitely are, aren't they? They definitely are. Um, right, we've got a few questions around some of the mapping, um, Martin. And some of these questions, I think, are possibly about um, turning them, things on their heads slightly, actually. So we've got a couple of questions around whether the mapping should show inaccessible spaces, whether the way that some of it's presented, is there a possibility that might skew accessibility? And also about access to uh, close to schools, not necessarily close to homes and potentially I suppose that could be in terms of access close to where people work and offices. Mm. Just interested in your thoughts on that Martin. Okay I'll pick the last one first. We, we have focused on close to home um, partly because part of the work with what we're doing here we are developing methods as we go along so you sort of pick a bit you, you experiment you see how it works and if it works okay then you can you can look at it in a different context and this this issue we have looked at close to home um, but there is the instant question, what about close to school? It's come up, yeah, we're interested, we haven't done it yet, but yeah, at some point in time, I can see that's going to happen. For me, uh, quite often, you know, the first question I have is, well, I can do it. But first of all, we need to understand what we're talking about. And secondly, we need to establish whether or not there is a nationally consistent data set which will allow us to do that. If so, we can, we can go forward. But it's definitely on the radar. 
Um, the other question about mapping inaccessibility. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one because, of course, access to natural green space standards, the buffer approach, it does map where you, you could say this is mapping where it's good. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it is. Um, the buffer zones are just zones within which uh, there are complicated network uh, situations. So we haven't been able to map local barriers. So like I said, we say that about one in three people we think are in the buffer. That doesn't mean they're within um, the, the requisite time distance to get to that space. And it may be that actually it's the other side of a motorway and you've got to go two miles down to get across. So it, it, there's, there's major room for improvement there, um, which uh, network analysis does. Unfortunately, it's very complicated. And, and we can't. We have some. We have some issues with getting some of the data that fuel it. Nonetheless, we think well, we've done uh, a bit of analysis, a dig into that. That one in three goes down, as I've said, to potentially one in four, maybe even one in six, and in a lot of places. So we are predominantly not dealing with uh, how accessible places are. We are predominantly dealing with how inaccessible you know uh, places are, and and the um, in the the uh, access um, inequalities mapping is a step in that direction to try to understand those places which aren't accessible um, and the degree to which they're not accessible and the, the factors which might make that of uh, particular interest uh, potentially to investors or policymakers and so on. So I tend to say uh, angst is interesting. Um, there's this concept of anti-angst. If you're interested in where it's not good, then anti-angst gives you that. But even that is quite, it's quite simplistic. Angst just tells you you're in, you're out, that's all. So the, the, the rest of the analyses we're trying to do that's trying to drill into whether does it matter that you are out because not everywhere which is outside of a buffer uh, is necessarily suffering a problem it could be that there's nobody living there um, so it's not a simple uh, it's not a simple picture and the, the work we're doing is, is multifactorial so you have to drill into a place you, you have to look at angst you have to look at the uh, access um, uh, um, uh, uh, equalities issues you have to look at the people that are actually there you have to look at other resources not just green uh, accessible natural green spaces there are other resources out there too to really get a picture of what's going on in a place and therefore what an appropriate sort of response might be so mm. complex complex picture we're kind of on it no, that, that, that that's really helpful martin and when you talk about sort of those other other resources that are out there because there, there's there's also some questions around um under some of these principles, well, I think it fits into the principles as well as the, the mapping around cultural heritage benefit. And I think I've seen somewhere about whether we should be referencing natural all the time. You know, does that terminology help or, or hinder? <laughs> be interested in panel's thoughts on that. We can start with you, Martin. <laughs> Uh, I only got part of the question it cut out there, but something about uh, terminology, does it help or hinder? Um, my yeah, view is ma always mapping, mapping beyond the accessible, uh, what we call accessible green space, but you know, are there cultural heritage benefits that we might want to describe as well? There might be, it depends what you mean by cultural heritage. I, I, and whether you can, you can't map everything. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite sayings, but I think there are, there are elements of cultural heritage which are probably you know, on the list of things that people uh, may want. And it's certainly the sort of historic environment is a uh, fertile ground. There is some conversation in the background that I'm having about connecting the sort of natural environment mapping that we're doing uh, with cultural heritage and what, um, what uh, historic um, environment heritage and so on. But um, that cultural heritage is beyond that. We haven't really broached that area uh, as yet. Uh, I'm sure it'll come up. In terms of the terminology, my, my stock answer is it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to a, a technical audience, a technical language will do. And if you're not, then you should simplify it um, without losing the essential meaning because simplification itself can sometimes confuse. So it's, it's an intractable, interminable problem. Um, I do my best. I'm sure a lot of people do. But it comes down to who you're talking to. Thank you, Martin. Any other thoughts from the panel yeah. on that one? But I think it's probably an area that we are perhaps weak on, perhaps it was an area that we're, you know, missing in terms of, you know, the, that broader cultural heritage in terms of designated areas and listed buildings and so on and so forth, doesn't really deal with the question. It's easy to map to some extent, forgive me, Martin, you know, we can switch on some layers and we know where it is, but it's cultural associations, which I think is probably what we're getting at, um, is more difficult to pin down and, it's, it, and in its significance and importance mustn't be under, underestimated. Um, you know, just because it's a patch of grass doesn't mean to say it has no value. Its value might be 
hugely important to the immediate and local population that use it. Um, so how we map that, how we capture that is, is a very valid question and a very, you know, very important bit that perhaps we need to just take away and think a little bit more about. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Judy, Judy. Yes, I'm just going to come back to the local dimension. When you allow local people to participate in mapping, they have their own agenda. And the character of the local population is important because, for example, I can point to really beautiful examples where Black Environment Network helped someone with a little patch of ground in front of a mosque, which is actually an English house, that mosque. They actually planted two very beautiful palm trees with funding. But when the community saw that, they loved it so much. It was a palm tree is a symbol of actually the first mosque. People gathered under a palm tree as the first mosque. As you know, a lot of the, the architecture, like columns and so on in temples and so on, they are actually trees. You know? And the other thing is, is that when the community saw that they loved it so much that they got the entire street leading up to the mosque planted up with beautiful palm trees. Now, palm trees are very expensive, and yet the local company raised money to do this. And in urban areas, as you know, you know, in many areas, as long as they're not invasive species, and so on, my goodness, palm trees are not invasive. They grow so slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very beautiful and so on. So there are opportunities where you actually mark a place with cultural dimensions that the people identify with, and it's green. You know, I think all these overlapping social, cultural benefit, you know, environmental benefits that overlap are extremely important to notice. And once you get communities to map a whole area, a whole ward and so on, while they're mapping, they notice what people are doing in particular patches, or they notice patches with absolutely nothing. And when they see those two things, so it gives them a motivation to take ownership of their area. When you pay them the kind of attention which says, actually, this whole thing is, is your local neighborhood. What are you going to do about it? This starts a conversation and it starts actions. Yeah, that, that, that's great, Judy. And, and it's about, we're not talking about accessible green space, are we, all the time? It's it's that whole piece of the neighbourhood. And, and what about, uh, have you got any any thoughts, Judy, about what if the locals are disinterested? I think somebody has jot, jotted this one down. Can you say that again? What? If local communities are disinterested. Well, they're only disinterested if you can't see anything becoming better. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you can show them that their lives become better, their environments. This is where I say, you know, to highlight examples with communities where people, when we used to do this, we used to take a pack of A4 photographs into a community center and show people things. And on these photographs are people who look like them. And they see environments that are like this, completely transformed. And when they see that, and there's people like them doing it, they want to do it too. It's as simple as that. When people can't see their way to, to life improving, that is really sad. And that is a lot of caught energy. People are frustrated, they're depressed and so on. When you can actually unlock it by showing what can be done, what transformations are possible, people cannot help but be enthusiastic. That is our experience. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really talking to those benefits. And I suppose, Jane, that probably gets into a bit of a question over um, how we might be describing some of those benefits and the, the evaluation. Can you remind us about the thinking around that as well? Um, the, um, the, the monitor, we're looking at a, a variety of ways of evaluating the standards. Um, and what would be really important is getting feedback from people um, about their experience of uh, green infrastructure, green space, and their engagement in it. And the Natural England's People and Nature Survey will be a really important means um, of capturing that and comparing it across time. Um, and we'll also be capturing a baseline which will uh, inform you know, the, the sort of future uh, sort of measures of, of progress that we're making. Um, but in terms of you know how we go about the evaluation, it'd be really useful to 
in, um, ensure that we're, we're looking at an innovative approach to that capturing of baseline and evaluation really engaging people you know from all sectors in how we put together that picture of where we are and you know i'd love to follow up with judy about um how we can ensure that um you know the voice of communities is heard within that exercise yeah grand thank you jane um, Andrew, we might want to come quickly to the poll, so you might just want to have a look at that. I don't know if you can see the data of that, but but before we do so, Jane, there's also been a few questions about sort of the, the different layering of the standards frameworks as well, um, in terms of um, how the, the GI standards framework sits with locally generated standards um, and other standards like the building with nature standards. It's probably worth just touching on that, isn't it? How they all nest together. Yes. So um, the the standards um, that we we will be promoting in the core menu, and also the standards that we're signposting the existing, you know, well loved standards like Green Flag Award, Building with Nature, Built in Trust, Brian, and so on. Um, all those will be available for local authorities to. Uh, adapt or adopt in their local plans, their local areas. And um, I mean, we're working closely with Building with Nature. Um, you know, uh, we we have representatives on each other's advisory groups. We have regular conversations and, uh, you know, looking forward to working with Building with Nature in terms of providing the rollout and the training that, that we can offer joint information about the standards. Um, and and I think that will apply to other standard zoners as well, you know, very much looking forward to working with them. But the, I know in Essex, um, they've uh, looked at um, working both with the building with nature and using our draft standards, um, developing their own local principles, consulting with local planning authorities on their principles. Um, and as a result of that exercise and sort of raised profile of standards, they've secured two additional posts for green infrastructure, which is fantastic. Thanks. That's great. Th th thank you, Jane. I think it's, it's helpful. It's helpful that understanding, isn't it? Andrew, did you have a chance to look at the poll? Because it's, it's uh, quite revealing, isn't it? Yes, thank you very much for everybody who has put it in. Um, top score there is considered to be too expensive to implement. Um, Possibly. I mean, I always, you know, an approach might be to think about well, what assets or what value does a site already have that could be retained, um, you know, and that applies to brownfield sites, urban intensification, right the way through to new development. If you're retaining and enhancing what we already have as a green infrastructure function, um, rather than ripping it out and then having to put it back in again, um, that's a thought. Um, but again, I suppose it's, it comes down to that awful phrase of you know designing down to the minimum um you know the counteract the counter argument we get what you pay for um and you know so much of what we see is designed down to that minimum so yes you know some of it might be more expensive but that value to the people who live and work in those places must must be considered um concern that it won't be adopted or maintained comes comes second um again yes appreciate that's a big issue um, particularly with local authorities who you know we just so squeezed on resources that um, their ability to uh, you know adopt um, and maintain um, open space in particular for example um, is a is a notable pressure we heard earlier this afternoon about you know how new developments are retaining that within their own management companies for example um, the lack of expertise I mean I'm hoping that the green infrastructure design guide helps you know with that in a big way um in providing that evidence and that you know that information on how to design um and you know you know again comes back to the the last question there on the last last two is you know what does it look like and how can we do it that's what the green infrastructure design guide is very much about yeah. but yes thank you for everyone contributing to those much appreciated thank you uh before i quickly close and say thanks to the panel final thoughts from jane and, and uh, judy just on what what might be your sort of very quick reflection on how you think people could get involved in the gi standards so from this conference from today jane and then judy okay um thanks amanda um we'll be pre-releasing uh, the mapping and some of the products the principles 
in the autumn and that will be accompanied by a survey with really welcome feedback um well, you know lovely to go in have a look try to use the products um and also we'll be doing further testing and development in the spring uh, very much uh, sort of look forward to the um more surveys and also the, perhaps the opportunity to test some of these products you know local planning authorities and we can invite you through the, uh, the gi partnership newsletter to do that consultation next summer then formal consultation yeah thank you thank you judy for me it is really building in the fact that many people perceive nature as anything green and to build on that continuity by building that continuity we build the deep knowledge about wildlife and nature that we want everyone to have. But to see that you can educate people through a cabbage, because you put a cabbage in the ground, you're interested in the quality of the soil, you're, you have wildlife coming to eat it, you want to eat it, but wildlife want to eat it. Before you know it, you have an environmental education program that is right in the middle of people's lives. And to do that and to, to expand access and deepen interest in all things green and so on, so that people can enjoy it and protect it. That is the way to go. Brilliant. Thank you, Judy. Um, and, and on that note, just want to say a huge thanks to uh, all of our speakers this afternoon, Martin, Jane, Andrew and Judy. Um, we're bang on time for, for finishing. So I think just, just to follow up at the end, um, I wanted to say a huge thanks to um, Town and Country Planning Association for partnering with, with Natural England uh, today for, the, for this conference. So thank you hugely and for all the technical support that, that goes with it. We will be supplying all of the, the material from today for all of the delegates. So that's a, a watch this space for, for material that, that will come out to you. And I guess finally, it looks like it's gonna be a really exciting autumn for, for the rollout of, of a lot of these pieces of work. So I think it's a definite watch this space. And uh, we're certainly really looking forward to continuing to engage with you on, on such an important topic. So thank you all ever so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.